Praise God. Well, just keep standing. We'll read our text very quickly. Um, we're going to, I've read this several times over the last few months, Genesis chapter 1, and then I think we'll, maybe a little later on, we'll, we'll go to Luke chapter 16, but Genesis chapter 1, if you want to know how it's going to end, you need to go to the beginning. If you want to know what God's, how it's going to finish, go back and read how it started. And so if we want to know what God's getting ready to do, we need to go back and find out what God already did. Hallelujah. This is Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 26. And God said, let's make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. And then he begins to go into categories over the fish of the sea, the fowls of the air, the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 28, and God blessed them. God said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it. Those are powerful charges by the Lord. You can be seated. The last two weeks we have preached on the kingdom of God, and today I'm going to continue on this subject. I cannot get it out of my spirit. I don't know if I'll get done today or if we'll keep preaching on it next week. But the kingdom of God is what the entire New Testament is about. It's the kingdom of God. When you go back <clears throat> to the book of Genesis, I read those verses because God did not make the earth for the animals. He made the animals for man. He made the trees for man. He made cycles and seasons and rivers and fountains and all of the things that God did on the first five days. He had man's heart in mind. He wanted to surprise man that when man looked at it, he would go, wow. You ever had somebody give you something that you thought you would never be able to obtain and they give it to you and you go, are you sure? Wow, this is mine? That's what I think God was hoping that Adam would feel like. So God, and I'm going to stretch your theology here a little bit. God never gave, when God created Adam, and Adam was created in full maturity. There was no need for development or language or intellect. He had it all. He was complete in God. He looked like God. He talked like God. He was in the image of God, the likeness of God. God wanted man to be an extension of who he was. He wanted him to be like Jesus who would be slain before the foundation of the world. And so, when Adam came into creation, God looked at him and he said, the earth is yours. He said, I'm giving you not just the Garden of Eden, but we read it. He said, take dominion over the earth. The Garden of Eden was just his house. It was just his estate. But God said, I'm giving you the entire earth. He said, subdue it. That meant there might be some things that would not initially want to yield to Adam. But God said, they will because I'm giving you dominion. 
I hope today that when you get done with hearing this message, that God will change your paradigm. The problem is most of the church is still living under the law and have never come into the kingdom message. We talk about the kingdom, but we live like slaves. We live for handouts, and we hope that God in his mercy will do something for us. That's not the intention of God. When God made Adam, he made him to live on the earth. He didn't give him heaven. He gave him the earth. He gave him a kingdom. If God wanted man to live in heaven, he would have created Adam in heaven. God said, I want a kingdom, so he created an earth. And he stuck man on that earth. He placed him on that earth, and he said, man is going to live on earth and never die, and he's going to rule and reign over the entire earth. If Adam had not sinned, he would not be in heaven right now. He would be on the earth. So, we're going to stretch it here a little bit, but there seems to be a thread in the Bible on this concept. Eternally, I don't think God is going to keep us in heaven. We were not created to live in heaven. We were created to live on an earth. And you say, but it's messed up. But the revelation says that the last thing that God is going to do is he's going to go back and he's going to make a new earth. And he's going to put the redeemed man on it. Hallelujah. And I don't know if we could go back and forth to heaven, but I promise you our, our future is not living on the streets of gold. It is living on an earth, hallelujah, where we walk in dominion by the power of God and we have authority over everything that is on the earth. You say, well, pastor, what about all the saints that are already in heaven? Well, how about Jude says, when the Lord comes back, he's bringing them with him. He's coming back with 10,000s of his saints. Why? Because they're going to live on the earth. Hallelujah. You and I eternally probably are going to live on the earth and not in heaven. If God just wanted us in heaven, he'd have put us in heaven to start with. Now the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to be in heaven, but it's like eating out. It's going out to a restaurant when we get done. Hallelujah. We're not going to stay there. We're going to come back and we're going to live on the earth by the authority to the Holy Ghost, to redeem by the power of the Lord. And God is going to give us a taste of what that is. Because the scripture says that the Lord, after the battle of Armageddon, is going to remove the devil from the earth for 1,000 years. It is the seventh day of creation. It is the Lord created the earth in six days, and he rested on the seventh day. So God, hallelujah, is in the process of building a kingdom and at the end of 6,000 years, Jesus himself, the, sec or the last Adam. See, there has to be an Adam on the earth to finish what the first Adam messed up. 
So the last Adam is going to come back on the, on the 7,000 year millennial reign. And for 1,000 years, Christ is going to live on the earth. And he says, I'm just going to give you a little taste of what it's going to be like when I make the new earth and there's no devil, there's no sickness, there's no disease, there's no heaviness, there's no debt, there's no bankruptcy, there's no divorce, there's no burying your children. Hallelujah. There's no dis appointment. Why? Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, uh, there is liberty. Uh, I declare that there is a kingdom uh, authority that God uh, is trying to release uh, by the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, get in your spirit. Uh, you are not saved, uh, but you have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Adam's name, Adam, was not just his personal name. It represented humanity. So God has always intended for you and I to rule and reign over the earth. Now, over the years, there's been this philosophy or message preached that Jesus said this. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. So right now, what we're dealing with is, I got so much in my spirit here that's rolling. Help me, Holy Ghost, to get this out. Hallelujah. When Jesus came on the scene, he did not come to re replace the Roman government. He did not come to replace Judaism. He came to fulfill prophecy. In, in Luke 16, I think it's verse 16, he said, The law and the prophets were until John, but since that time, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. The word repent literally means to change your mind. It doesn't mean dragging up all of your failures and all of your sins from the past and listing them to God. It literally means to do an about face, to change your mind. What God is trying to do to us, and I am one of those that the Lord had to do a number on over the years. I was raised in poverty and raised in rejection and raised in failure until the enemy convinced me that there's nothing that you can ever have success. But Oh, I stand today, hallelujah, on the platform of when God wants to fulfill his word, he can do it. May God change your mind today that what the devil's saying to you, what the enemy is declaring over you, holding your past failures, declaring that is your future, that is a lie from hell, hallelujah. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but it is in power. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it is righteousness. It is joy. It is peace in the Holy Ghost. God wants you to rule. So when Jesus came on the scene, he's coming at the end of John's message. John's message was also repent. He was telling them that you're getting ready to see something that's going to mess with you. It's going to mess with your traditional thinking. It's going to challenge you. See, so many people have philosophies. The word philosophy, if you break it down, philo means love. Ophthasy means the way you think. So philosophy means you love the way you think. So
So people go, well, this is my philosophy. No, that's just how you love to think. <laughs> philosophy is not necessarily truth. I know lots of people that call themselves Christians, but don't go to church, don't pray, don't fast. They have created a philosophy that allows himself to label themselves as a Christian, yet walk independent of the Bible. Is, but that's how they love to think. Because if I think this way, then I don't have to go to church and I won't feel guilty. Or if I think this way, I'm not going to fast three days because I'll get hungry. Welcome to being human. So, this transition from John to Christ was about changing your mind, changing your philosophy. And Jesus said the law and the prophets were until John. But he said, I'm telling you that today the kingdom of God is it here. Repent. What he was doing, Jesus said, he just slammed the door on an entire dispensation. He just stood back and he shut the door on the dispensation of the law that had been all the way back to Moses. He said, that's over. I'm here to declare to you that what the prophets prophesied about is no longer going to be prophesied about, but it is now fulfilled in the flesh that I am standing before you. That's why the Lord would call himself a king. So see, there can't be a kingdom without a king. There can't be a kingdom without subjects. And Jesus talks about this. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. So, I'm trying to be obedient to the Spirit of the Lord here. The very first message that Jesus preached, Luke 4.43 says it, he began to preach the kingdom of God. It's very interesting when you read the ministry of Christ. He never preached deliverance. He never preached healing. He never preached prosperity. He preached the kingdom of God. Now, we went through a couple of decades that the pros we called it the prosperity message. How many have heard that preached over the years? It's kind of like Amway. It only works for the people that are preaching it. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that they can preach on sowing the seed, which is biblical, but they never tell you to send the seed to a missionary. It's the two million people that are watching. God wants you to sow the seed, and he's going to pay off your house. He's going to save your children and send it to P.O. Box 494, so-and-so ministries, and God's going to bless you. Then fly off to the next place. I 100% believe in prosperity. Because I don't like poverty. I've been there. But what I want to bring you to an understanding of is the message that God wants us to preach is not prosperity. It is the kingdom of God. You say, but why? Because Jesus said this. If you seek first the kingdom and he prefaces that he said listen he said the world is seeking after clothes and cars and food and money and health he said 
Your Father knows that you have need of these things. So he's not discounting that you can have a better home, that you can be debt-free, that you can drive a car that don't break down. Now, not just a car, but a dream car. I lose that today on this house. That God would not just meet your needs, but he'll bless your socks off. That you walk up to the garage and say, I wanted that car all my life. And guess what? There's no note on it. It's paid for by the power of the Holy Ghost. And I'm not even asking you to sow a seed. But Jesus said this. He said, I'm acknowledging that you have needs. But he said, what I'm telling you, if you want your needs met, quit asking me to meet your need and begin to ask me for the kingdom of God. For he said, if you seek first the kingdom of God, then all of this other stuff is wrapped up in the DNA of the kingdom of God. And he said, when you seek the kingdom of God and his presence, you look behind you say, who is that? That's goodness and mercy. See, uh, they're following me uh, all the days of my life. What is that? That's my retirement chasing me down. Uh, what is that? That's my free house. Uh, that's my debt-free life. Uh, goodness and mercy. It's in the kingdom of God. See, the enemy wants to blindside you with your needs. That when you get in the presence of the Lord, you spend all your time begging God for stuff. And he's saying, why are you talking to me about that? Well, Lord, I have need, he said. It's in the kingdom. Talk to me about the kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Hallelujah. And then all of these other things shall be added unto you. The very first message that Jesus preached was the kingdom. Go back to the New Testament. Paul preached the kingdom. James preached the kingdom. Peter preached the kingdom. John preached the kingdom. Hallelujah. Why? Because they understood that everything that man needs is in the kingdom of God. The last message that Jesus preached was the kingdom. After resurrection, the Bible said he hung around for 40 days speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He didn't preach anything else. He just preached the kingdom of God. Why? Because he understood that for you and I to walk in dominion and power is by the kingdom. See, the kingdom of God is not about keeping you out of the lion's den. The kingdom of God is about shutting the mouth of the lions while you're there. The kingdom of God is not about keeping you out of the fiery furnace. The kingdom of God is about keeping the flames from burning you. See, the kingdom of God exposes the kingdom of the evil. The kingdom of God is not a natural kingdom. It's not doing away with government. It's releasing, hallelujah, a new creation of men and women that don't do right because the law says so, but they do right, hallelujah, because they've got new laws written on the heart of flesh by the power of God, and God rules and reigns in them. So he leaves after 40 days, goes back up into heaven, sits down on the right hand of the Father. Father and Jesus probably high five. Father says, good job, son. Father and Jesus says, got it done. And it is finished. What was he saying when it is finished? He was saying, I've released the kingdom. 
that you gave Adam. I've released it to a new creation. When Nicodemus came to Jesus and he was asking Christ questions and he's and Jesus said he was asking things pertaining to the kingdom and Jesus said this he said no man unless he's born of water and of spirit can enter into the kingdom of God so what he was saying was an unregenerated mind and spirit can never get into the kingdom of God. Whenever unbelief dominates you, sin is entered in. So, Pastor, that's really rough. The Bible calls unbelief a sin. Now, when unbelief comes against you, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's where you use the kingdom of God authority. Right. And you say, uh-uh, not today. <clears throat> You're not going to get in my mind and begin to torment me with what if, what if, what if. Because, see, that's how the devil got Eve to start with. It's what if, what if, what if. And she should have just looked at the devil and said, shut up and get behind me like Jesus did. Because on the, um, when Jesus, hallelujah, came out of baptism, the Bible says that he immediately was confronted with the devil. And Jesus, hallelujah, began to speak to him and would say, it is written, it is written, it is written. And one of the first things that Jesus did after that was he cast out a demon, the man of Gadara. There is this conflict that comes between Christ and the, the demonic world. And they, when the demon saw Jesus, they said, We know you! How could that be? Unless they had already seen him. They saw him... When the devil became an unemployed, unemployed cherub looking for another place to light. And Jesus said, I was there and I saw him fall from heaven as lightning. And the demon saw that. And then they said this, thou art Christ. And Jesus said, you need to shut up. Why would Jesus stop demons from announcing who he was? This is why I think. Because God didn't want man introduced to Christ by a devil. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He wanted them to be introduced to Christ because of the kingdom of God. Not some devil, it's not some demon preaching to them. And Jesus, every time it happened, he would say the same thing. Hush your mouth. You're not going to tell them who I am. I will show them who I am by the demonstration and the power of the Holy Ghost. And so, Jesus resurrects, <clears throat> preaches the kingdom for 40 days. In fact, when he sent his disciples out, when he ordained them, the Bible says he told them, he said, preach the kingdom. It's here. We're not living in John's time. We're not living in the prophets and the law. It's here, the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? It is heaven's influence in an earthly dimension. God, Jesus never prayed for anything. When he needed a donkey, <clears throat> he told his disciples, he said, I own a donkey that somebody's been taking care of for me. 
Go on over there and untie it. And when he, they start untying it, God said, what are you doing? He said, Master needs it. They, oh, well, it's his anyway, so go ahead and take it. Now, I'm elaborating a little bit there, but what I'm saying is that Jesus, hallelujah. What I, here's what I want to say. Somebody is living in your house in the kingdom. Somebody, hallelujah, is driving your car. Somebody is living in your abundance. What am I saying? Is that when the time comes that God says, I need to release to you the benefits of the kingdom, he just had somebody watching over it so it would be in good shape by the time it was released to you. I declare in the name of the Lord that somebody's been watching over $20 million that belong to this house in the name of God. And I tell you, Today I need it. So I'm declaring that we're loosening the angelic host, that either the kingdom of God works or it don't work. May that statue downtown begin to tremble and shake because of the anointing and the glory of God that's in the atmosphere. Let me tell you something about, see, everybody thinks that everybody in the kingdom lives under the same rules. Not so. There are promises in that book, but in reality, not very many people <clears throat> actually enjoy them because they don't have the revelation of the kingdom of God. I'm going to go somewhere else with this. <clears throat> I think this is in. I'm going to have to open the Bible on this one. I think it's in Matthew chapter 13. Because <clears throat> I'm sure that over the years <clears throat> I've struggled with this a little bit myself. Especially over one statement that Jesus made. Verse 10, it says of Matthew 13, The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Verse 15, For these people's heart is wax gross, that literally means calloused. You know what calluses are? It's just the continual rubbing on it that it creates dead skin. Dead skin. You can cut a callus off. I used to have to cut calluses off my feet because I ran so much. <clears throat> you cut them off and you can't even feel it. It's just dead. This is why lots of people can get in a service like today. They don't feel anything. Their heart has become calloused. <clears throat> so the Lord says this. He says, For their heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their ears and hear with their ears, or see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and they should understand with their heart. They should be converted, and I should heal them. And I'm thinking, well, isn't that the whole purpose? for you to heal them, for them to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. <clears throat> but if you go back a little bit, this is about the parable of the sower and the seed. And <clears throat> I'm trying to find the scripture here that says it. Anyway, Jesus is saying this. He said the seed <clears throat> is the word of the kingdom. He says it's sown. He said, but some people, they don't get it. And the enemy comes in and steals the seed. <clears throat> so the, the disciples are asking Jesus, they're saying, okay, 
you're always <clears throat> talking in parables. Why? Jesus said, because I don't want them to understand what I'm saying. And they don't understand that. He says, but unto you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. He said, Peter, James, John. He said, I'm going to unfold it to you. And I'm not going to speak to you in parables or secrets. He said, but I'm going to show you exactly what I meant. And he said, because Peter, you left your wife at home. James and John, you left your father. You left your livelihood to follow me. Some of you left your prof professions because you were hungry for me. And he said, I cannot give something to someone that they're not asking for. And he said, because it would violate my laws. It violates my holiness. Because I can only give that which is asked for. God will never take you somewhere you don't want to go. He will never give you something you did not ask for. He will never reveal to you something that you do not want to see. And the only, that's why it's a limited amount of people that really get it because most of the body of Christ is not hungry for God. Our church is unusual. Yesterday, I would say we probably had 300 people in this building for prayer meeting. It's unheard of for that kind of turnout for prayer meeting. What is that? Because there is a hunger for the things of the Lord. So that means that what he said, they'll never get it because they're not asking for it. And he told Nicodemus, he said, the only way that you can get a hold of the kingdom of God is you got to be born again, not in your mother's womb, but your spirit man has to be born again by the power of God. Problem for so many believers is they've been in the birth canal for 19 years. 20 years. It's like, my God, get born. So, in the kingdom of the Lord, you have the king. In, 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 in some countries right now, there is the king. I mean, they didn't, I guess they didn't call him this, but Castro was a king. Idi Amin was a king. Some of the African nations, they still have kings. England has a king, but, I mean, it's just basically in, in theory only. They have an official government. But in a true kingdom, you have a king. A king can bless you outside the law. Why? How can that be? Because his word is law. So if the king decides to favor you, even though the law maybe doesn't make provision for that, when he releases the favor on you, it becomes law. Because he is the king and his word cannot be challenged. And so we are in a place where the Lord is trying to release some things now because we have stepped over into another realm. He who hunger, when you're not eating food on a fast, you are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. You cannot come out of a fast and not have a good Sunday service. You cannot come out of a fast and not have a move of the Holy Ghost. Listen, God is not interested. There are so many people, they don't want the kingdom. They want emotionalism. I was raised in it. 
shake bobby pins out, look like they're having an epileptic fit, and then get back in their broke down car and move into their old apartment uh, and sick and discouraged and busted, uh, and they have no authority. But they can get into emotionalism. Why? Because it triggers the soulish realm. God is not interested in just emotionalism. He wants you to have revelation that when the enemy comes in like a flood, greater is the king in you than the king that's in the world. So, on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God begins to fall in that upper room, Jesus told his disciples, he said, you need to tarry there until you be endued with power from on high. The word power there in Acts, I think it's one and eight, somewhere in there. It literally means to be clothed with the ability of God. So what he was saying was, you're coming into a kingdom, and I'm going to give you a dominion to rule and reign over it. Revelation says this about you and I. See, Jesus, <clears throat> one place Jesus said, <clears throat> did not the scriptures call you gods? He was not talking in the sense of deity because in biblical times, they called people who had authority in the legal system, they could call them gods like judges because they had so much power. <clears throat> but the Lord says in Revelations that he has made you and I kings and priests. Priesthood represents heaven on earth. Kings rule the kingdom of God in the earth. So every one of you that have been born again, see, there's lots of people that are born again going to heaven, but they don't believe in speaking in tongues, so they'll never speak in tongues. There's lots of people that will go to heaven, but they don't believe in certain revelations of the Scripture, don't want to believe it, don't want to hear it, so they're never going to. God never reveals to you something you don't want. <clears throat> <clears throat> revelation from the Lord is where God just opens up a vein. You ever been reading your Bible and go, oh, my God, I've never seen that before. And the thing about revelation is it seems so simple. Isn't what I'm preaching you simple? You're going, I mean, it's, it, in reality, it doesn't seem deep. I mean, it's just verses that we've read all our lives. But then when God begins to connect them together and weave, hallelujah, purpose, something begins to turn on in the spirit. And this is why the Bible says that the eyes of our understanding would be opened, that we would know what is the hope of his calling, hallelujah, and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. What is the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints? Paul said it is. He said, what is in us is Christ. So he's saying what the wealth that's in the saints is what comes when Christ is inside of you. So God, when he's advancing you in the kingdom, he will take you through uncharted territory. And when you begin to go into uncharted territory, one of the reasons why there has been such resistance against this church and building this, this new sanctuary is because we are taking territories that belong to the kingdom of darkness. And so any time the kingdom of darkness feels threatened, it begins to resist 
and begins. This is like Nicholas. Didn't he do a fantastic job today? Hallelujah. Just anointed, but there was an utterance. I bore such witness with that. There is a spirit of intimidation. It can come in so many forms. It can become, it can come against you in, in struggling in your business. It can come against you that all of a sudden you can't figure out why you and your wife are not doing well together. It can come in your children going wayward. It can come in a health issue. But it is the enemy trying to stop you from stepping over into the dimension mention of the Holy Ghost. This is a word for somebody today. If you have hell assaulting you, it's because God is getting a hold of you and he's telling you, I'm getting you ready to give you some territory that you have never possessed. I'm going to let your feet stand on some land that you've never been on before. You are getting ready to reach over into another dimension by the power of the Holy Ghost. Don't ever think for a moment that the kingdom of God is just a good philosophy, but it is the dynamic, domineering, all power of the Holy Ghost that is inside of you and me, that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raises up a standard against it, and you begin to sing, I got to praise, and I got to let it out. Is there anybody in this building that feels the power of the Holy Ghost? Daniel chapter 7, verse 27 says, And the kingdoms and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And all dominion shall serve and obey him. The reason that we are in such turmoil right now in this nation is because thus saith the Lord, I am bringing this nation back to the precepts of which I birthed her for. And we have riled the demon spirits. But God said, I got a rim that saith God that I raised up for such a time as this. And they're going to stand in the gap and the powers of hell are going to be defeated. Prepare yourself, says the Lord, for the best is yet to come. There is a release of the dominion, of the dominion. I don't want to just dance. I don't want to just be healed. I want to operate in the old governor, glory power of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Give you just a little bit more and we'll quit. When Jesus was resurrected, he said at communion at the Passover, the Last Supper, he said, y'all drink this wine, eat this bread. I probably didn't say y'all, but he uh, <clears throat> said, you guys, I don't know, I don't know if he's from, we're going to make him a southerner, he said. Anyway, said, drink, eat this bread and drink this wine. And I've always thought that, you know, he must have partook of the cup, but he said this. He said, I'm not drinking of this until I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So he was telling them that this wine has synergy in it. Me and this wine are connected because the only way that this became wine was something had to be crushed for the power to be released out of the grapes. Nobody raises wine. They raise grapes. 
But grapes are raised to be crushed. But it's in the crushing, hallelujah, that the power is released that makes the heart of man happy. So the Lord understood that there was something going on. He said, because the kingdom is coming. <clears throat> then he, after resurrection, <clears throat> he speaks to Peter and he said, thou art a, he said, thou art Peter, which means Petros, which if you look it up in the original, it means little rock or piece of a bigger rock. The Catholics should have went back and read Greek because they've got a whole foundation built on the misinterpretation of the Greek language. He said, <clears throat> you're not the big rock. You're the piece. You're the little piece of a big boulder of a bigger rock. He said, but on this rock, which means Petra, which means a boulder, Big. He said, this is what I'm going to build my church on. And he said this after he came out of raiding hell. He said, I am he who was dead, but I am alive for now and evermore. You know what he was saying was? The devil had his best shot, but there is nothing that he can ever do to me that will bring me back to where I was at Calvary. He was saying this, I have hung on the cross for the last time. I declare in the name of the Lord, we are bringing an end to some things that have harassed us and tormented us. And I'm looking at them and saying, I was dead, but hallelujah, I had the keys to what? To death, to hell, and to the grave. And then he looked at Peter, he said, I am giving you keys that operate the kingdom. Then he makes this wonderful statement. Whatever you lock in the earth, I will lock in heaven. Whatever you unlock in the earth, I will unlock in heaven. He was telling Peter, I'm giving you some keys that there have been some doors that the last dispensation, you couldn't open them. See, there have been areas of our lives that we've wanted to go into, but we didn't have the key of revelation to open it. See, we, for the last 30 years, everybody in church, we've just been thinking, you know, being a great Christian is just being having prosperity and, and all kinds of money and being debt-free. And that's not the kingdom. The kingdom, hallelujah, is dealing with the demonic kingdoms. I love this verse. I, I think I have it written down. It's in Revelations. But this is how... This is how this thing's going to end. Revelations 11 and 15. It says, the kingdoms of this world are not going to be, but have become the kingdoms of our Lord and Christ. So what are we doing we are slowly going back to Genesis 1 
where the Lord told Adam, the first Adam, I'm giving you dominion over the whole earth. But see, Adam messed up. So the last Adam came along, hallelujah, just as Adam was the father of all mankind, Jesus became the seed of Abraham and the first fruit of many brethren. And every time somebody comes into the kingdom, they're coming out of the DNA of the last Adam, a new creation. Now, if if any man be in Christ Jesus, all things pass away and all things become new. He is a new creation in Christ Jesus. I may look like this on the natural, but when you get on the inside, I got a whole kingdom of heaven that is backing me up by the power of the Holy Ghost. There are angels, saith the Lord. I'm giving you an army. All right, we normally get out here quarter till. I got one more really good thought I need to give you. <laughs> the Bible says that we are ambassadors of Christ. That means we are representing somebody that's not here. I think it's Paul that talks about it, said we are aliens and strangers. That we are in the world, but we are not of the world. That we live inside of a government, but we live under another government that has preeminence over the laws of man. So when an individual is given ambassadorship and he is sent or she is sent to another country. She goes there or he goes there by himself, but he is not alone. If where he's at, the citizens or the law of that country this is why ambassadors have immunity. This is why their bags don't get checked. They have immunity. They have pouches, ambassador pouches that cannot be searched. See, God has given you the hidden treasures of the Holy Ghost that when you walk into warfare, the devil doesn't get to take, you, take your shoes off and your coat off and take your suitcase apart and say, no, you can't have the word. You can't have any faith. No, you're not going to preach that healing. God said, I'm not letting going to search what you got, that when you come into the enemy's domain, that you are packing, hallelujah, the word of the Lord which is a sword of the Spirit, and by faith you declare, hallelujah, on enemy territory that I am here representing my Father. But if the enemy, if the law or the citizens of that country wound you or attack you, you are not there by yourself. They didn't wound you. They wounded the army that represents the nation that you just came from. Hallelujah. That's when we had all of those citizens in Iran, I think it was, when Donald Trump or when um, Ronald Reagan got voted in, the day he got voted in, They'd held those people for almost, I think, like 200, uh, two years, something like that. But the day that Ronald Reagan got voted in as president of the United States, and I think the previous one was Jimmy Carter, who was a weenie. <clears throat> it's the truth. We got some gutless people that are supposed to stand up and represent us. 
by the power of the Holy Ghost into the legal systems and they just roll over like a whipped dog when we get in trouble. But thank God, hallelujah, we got a man coming back that'll stand up by the power of the Holy Ghost. And we're declaring in the name of Jesus comes along the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord in Christ. You say, how can that happen? Because the church is declaring it in the name of the Lord that what the enemy intended evil, God turned it around for good. So William and the snow, there's a natural army that was defending those hostages. And they said, either you let them go or you're not going to have 200 hostages. You're going to have an entire army of the United States of America come down on you, and you're going to wish that you'd have let them go. This is the army that you and I have. For Psalms 91, he shall give his angels charge over you and... They shall bear you up in their hands, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. A thousand will fall on your one hand, and ten thousand shall fall on your other. Yet it shall not come nigh unto thy dwelling, but thou shalt see or behold the reward of the wicked. And so you are not going into battle by yourself, but when you step out by faith and declare in the name of the Lord that my God is backing me up, the Lord says, hey, I'm just sitting over here on the throne next to my father but I got an army hallelujah that I'm loosen in the earth and they will go before thee and set thee free stand with me <laughs> hallelujah prayer partners come <clears throat> hallelujah hallelujah Let's invade the kingdom of darkness today. If you've got some real sickness in your body today, come on right now before we invite anybody else and grab one of these prayer partners. If any two agree on any one thing, if you need healing in your body right now, if you're a diabetic, if you've got arthritis in your body, if you have a pacemaker, you have heart problems, you can come on. Yes, back trouble. Listen, you come grab one of these prayer partners. And you say, Pastor, we've not done this before, but we're shifting over to something in the name of the Lord. And all over this building right now, I want you to begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Sunday. Hallelujah. If they can be healed in Catherine Kuhlman's meetings without anybody ever laying hands on them, right now there is healing virtue flowing in this building in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 God, we thank you. Now, Lord, we're just commanding. We're not asking you to do it. We're commanding the demon spirits of hell, of sickness and infirmity to walk out of this building in the name of the Lord. God, that we are as the Israelites, not one feeble crossed over into Canaan land, not one sick crossed over into your inheritance. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you have a need now that is independent of, of, of sickness, you want a prayer partner, come on quickly. It could be relationship, your children, finance. You need somebody to stand with you in prayer. You can come on and then the whole church, we're going to fill this place up because God is pulling you. There is a kingdom place the Lord is trying to pull you into. May the Lord fill you today with the spirit of hunger. He who hungers and thirsts for righteousness shall be filled. All right, church, come on. Let's, let's get up tight. Let's fill it up. Our prayer.